for natural selections, which is my Substack this week, I I did a dive into uh, near infrared radiation, and we've talked about that uh, a couple of times here on Dark Horse, and indeed at the end of my natural selections post, I link to the three places that we've talked about some of the benefits of sunlight and a couple other places where I've written about it um, before in natural selections, the benefits of being outside, the benefits of fresh air, uh, vitamin D, a little bit about um, what seems to be the case that um, melatonin that we hear about, which is generated by the pineal gland, uh, is circulating melatonin. And that's what we hear about that's what we're taking these supplements some people at night to help them get to sleep um, but it seems to be the uh, less the less important the less uh, common kind of melatonin in our bodies and that is to say the melatonin that is produced by our pineal glands and which is called circulating melatonin in fact more of the melatonin that we have and there are a couple of other minor sources but the majority of melatonin it seems uh, that we are generating by our bodies is uh, in the mitochondria in what's called subcellular melatonin. And what prompts the mitochondria to make subcellular melatonin is near-infrared radiation. And near-infrared radiation is coming from the sun. In fact, approximately, by many estimates, 70%, that's 70% of the photons uh, that hit your body from the sun and not just yours, but mine too, and his, wow. and all the all the all the peoples and the cats and the everything. Uh, about seventy percent of the photons uh, that are hitting you are in the near infrared part of the spectrum. So uh, that means that visible, ultraviolet, middle, and far infrared, and everything on the outside of those of you know to you know to the outside of ultraviolet and to the outside of infrared, um, all of that is comprises 30% of the photons and near infrared, just off the red end of, of what we call the visible spectrum, because we got to name it and it's our visible spectrum, um, are these near infrared photons. And they are unique uh, in many ways. And one of them is that they go pretty deep into tissue. And in fact, the... Um, the cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid in your central nervous system, in both um, the interstices of your, like the ventricles of your brain, and um, running also down through your spinal cord, the cerebrospinal fluid seems specifically adapted to reflect near infrared photons deep, deep, deep into your brain, such that the deep crevices of your brain, the gray matter of your brain, are actually bathed in sunlight, not invisible light. It's not, it, it looks dark in there, but they've got these near infrared photons and everywhere that near infrared photons get to, the mitochondria appear to be prompted to make subcellular melatonin, which in turn is an explosively powerful antioxidant and just a general sort of cleaner upper of all sorts of detritus that happens because of normal metabolic processes. All right, so I'm gonna slow you down here yeah. and just figure out whether I uh, understand the basics. Basically, let's geek out a little bit on the science here. Yep. Near infrared mm -hmm. is outside of the human visual spectrum. Yes. It penetrates deeply in a way that light does not. And this actually is intuitive because infrared is heat as far as our experience. And you can imagine that if you pointed a warm source, if you pointed a hairdryer at, uh, at your skin, that it would penetrate more deeply than light. The light, I mean... Light, you know, a very bright light can penetrate your finger. You can see a flashlight through your finger. But um, but in general, you would expect light to die off very quickly near the surface and heat to go a little bit farther. So near-infrared and heat aren't synonyms, but I, I think the analogy holds. And I, I will say, I actually just show my screen here for a minute, Zach, or for a little bit. Uh, so this is, this is the post. It is dark inside your head, but even there the sun does shine. And um, I'm going to read the first couple of Actually, I'll just read the first couple of bits because, um, and then I'll show the spectrum. Your thoughts are born in darkness. All the biology and chemistry and electricity that comprise your brain exist in darkness. Visible light does not pass through your skull or into your brain. The motor messages going out, move that, go there, and the sensory messages coming in, smell this, feel that, occur in darkness. So too do reflections on the past, predictions of the future, plotting and planning, analysis and logic, storytelling and imagining, all happen where the sun doesn't shine. Except that, that last part is not actually true. It is dark inside your head, but even there, the sun does shine. So again, the visible spectrum of which here we have um, 
and I mentioned, you know, everyone who's been through probably elementary school has, has seen this, uh, where the visible spectrum, and again, that's so named only because it is our visible spectrum. Uh, there are plenty of organisms that see into the ultraviolet and others that see into the infrared, but our visible spectrum is named because we get to name it because we're the ones with language. And so it's the visible spectrum, even though it's just our visible spectrum, is this tiny band in the middle of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, off to the short wavelength end, you have ultraviolet off the violet end, and off to the long wavelength end, you have, you have infrared. And infrared on this graphic is just one big block, but the closer to red you are, is, that's the near infrared, and then you get to medium infrared and, and far infrared. Okay, so a couple things. One, yeah. uh, your point about we named the spectrum, that's why we call it visible. There are creatures that perceive into the infrared and there are creatures that perceive into the ultraviolet so it is not inherently the limit of of these kinds of perceptions and, and i and i write about that some here too yep um okay melatonin yes circulating melatonin is functioning as a hormone yeah. Okay. So hormone, I'm just going to fill in some details here. Let me just say, though, yeah. one of the things I learned, which may be, for me, the most staggering, and it might be really exciting to you too, or maybe really boring to most people who don't care about phylogenetics much, but that apparently the, so melatonin is ancient, like billions of years ancient, like a, like maybe the oldest uh, molecule that is now used as a hormone that exists. Okay, um, and far older than vertebrates, far older than animals even, um, and its original function is as an antioxidant. That the hormonal function is a latter, uh, an, an add-on function that came later. Okay, now this is going to force me to stretch into a realm where I'm not expert and may get something wrong. Mm -hmm. But a, I don't think it's terribly surprising that melatonin, which we experience or we understand best as a hormone which is related to the induction of sleep is connected to some very ancient pathway, some pre-animal pathway, because the earth being a place where you have these two very different phases every day, um, a, a molecule that is involved in uh, something which varies based on whether it's night or day uh, would be adopted into this uh, this highly complex pathway in, in higher animals. Well, and the um, in part, uh, what what I'm learning and reading some of the scientific literature on this is it's a mistake to think of melatonin as a hormone of sleep. Um, that circulating circulating melatonin from the pineal gland is associated with darkness, and then subcellular melatonin associated with the mitochondria prompted by. Um, being bombarded by near infrared photons is associated with daylight and wakefulness. And so it is helping and train our circadian cycles for sure. Uh, but in fact, if we are not exposed to near infrared light, to near infrared photons, then we will have a much harder time getting entrained and, and A, having subcellular melatonin, uh, having antioxidants, the most powerful antioxidants we have, cleaning up a bunch of the detritus in our cells, which is likely to make us um, less healthy. And it will also make it more likely that the pineal gland is going to have to work overtime to get enough circulating melatonin produced because it's, it's supposed to be is some of the thinking now. The pineal gland is basically supposed to be doing like backup. Like let's, let's, let's just produce a little bit more when all the melatonin produced in the mitochondria during the day can't quite get you through the night. And uh, if, if what we have done is for, you know, for an entire evolutionary history, we were outside. We were expected to be bathed in near infrared light all day, every day. And we came inside, but we still spent a lot of time outside. And we still had campfire. So the sun emits near-infrared radiation. The moon, moonlight, emits near-infrared radiation. Fire emits near-infrared so radiation. So near-infrared radiation is bounced off the moon. It's bounced off the moon, exactly. It's not generating its own. Campfire, fire of all sorts, candlelight, is generating near-infrared radiation. Incandescent light bulbs. A much smaller amount. You know, the sun is the major producer, and uh, and I actually don't know moon versus campfire. I assume campfire is actually producing more than than you know mostly uh, uh, the the moonlight would. But um, even sitting inside by candlelight at night, you get some near infrared radiation, and that will help you your body know what to do and entrain your cycles. 
or sitting with an incandescent bulb. But what doesn't emit any near-infrared radiation at all is fluorescent bulbs or the LEDs that we currently have. And this is not due to technical, uh, technological limitations. We could be, but we are not, because once again, the reductionism and the hubris of modern scientism has said, ah, light is what we see by, and therefore the only thing that light is is what we see by. And so what I will do as the creator of a product is I will create something uh, that, and maybe I'll even call it full spectrum because it's full visible spectrum. But it doesn't, these, these so-called full spectrum bulbs that we are seeing now um, only are full visible spectrum. They don't go into the near infrared at all, which means if you were inside all day and you have no incandescent lights, you don't have a fire in your fireplace, you don't have candle lights, uh, you are getting almost no near-infrared radiation at all. And to the degree that you are not healthy, and you're probably not healthy, uh, that may be a major cause. Interesting. Uh, so I do, you know, want to give the manufacturers of these things their due. I don't really want to give the manufacturers of fluorescence their due because right. my sense is we were all sold a bill of goods. Fluorescents are wonderfully electrically efficient, but they are not green, never were green. The yeah. mercury in them makes them dangerous. They never should have been released. And, and they, they you know, have an oscillation, right? Like almost no one no thinks that they are doing well under fluorescence. They are way right. too cold. Yeah. They are full of mercury. You break one you're distributing mercury in your house. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, they're bad bulbs. LEDs have potential, but in some sense, the it is the it's not even that people think that the visual spectrum is all that matters. It's that the market is effectively looking for how many lumens you put out, and that's the measure we use. Right, that's the but measure. now like lumens and temperature, like. Increasingly, some savvy consumers think, oh, I'll also look at temperature. It's still not enough. Right. And yeah. in fact, I've been obsessed with the temperature measurement Color temperature. forever right. because the LED bulbs that you buy on average are also way too cold, right? And they say deceptive things like daylight, and that's right. really a very cold light. And so anyway, yep. you know, it's very hard to buy them. The higher the color temperature number, the colder the light. Mm -hmm. So you're actually looking for... 2700 is somewhere in the neighborhood of tungsten um, and it's very hard to get anything warmer than but even that. so it's only visible spectrum so that right. may make you feel like okay i'm not i'm not living in a basement here but it's not it is not full spectrum actually sure of course not and i would point out that Back in the days when tungsten light bulbs were effectively all there were or you had a choice between that and fluorescence people used to deride the tungsten bulbs Mm -hmm. as uh, heat generators that happen to put out some light. Yep. Um, so anyway, there is this sense, and it's exactly like, mm -hmm. you know, what we've done with uh, uh, milk, right? Mother's milk for babies. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's food for babies. Yeah, it is, but <laughs> that right. ain't all it is. And yeah, that's right. And with everything. And, you know, this is, this is a recurring theme in our book too, right? Like food is not just sustenance, sex is not just reproduction, and at the smaller level, you know, light is not just where, what you see by milk is, you know, mother's milk is not just uh, what what keeps the baby alive because it's getting calories and, you know, the macronutrients. It's not just about fat, protein, and carbohydrates, as easy as that is to measure and to say and to keep track of. And that's part of the problem is that, you know, the harder it, the more complex the system, the harder it is to have a simple rubric, a simple rule, say, ah, oh, I just need to do this, and now I know what to buy, now I know what to think, now I can like outsource that that thing over there and be free of having to, frankly, think for myself. I mean, and it's a particular defect of uh, markets when you market to a consumer because yes. you know the consumer becomes obsessed with the megahertz of the processor, the megapixels of the sensor, mm -hmm. the you know number of lumens of the light bulb. Right, because they there's something that is maybe the most fundamental thing you're trying to do, but you're not juggling all of the trade-offs. And it, actually, this is this is interesting because there's there's like a there's a sex difference in terms of what kinds of simple metrics men and women tend to be focused on. But in both cases, it's still just simple, ridiculous metrics. Okay, well, yeah, maybe Fairfax should get down off the ladder yeah. now. <laughs> I wish he would stick to the former. It's spelled differently. Doesn't matter. I don't know why that matters. <laughs> um, okay, so um, with like 
I'm thinking about with a computer or a car. It's it, I remember it used to be sort of a, 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 a joke, a sort of a way to dismiss, oh, oh, the woman cares about the color of the thing and uh, the man and maybe the size of the screen um, if it's if it's a if it's a computer, if it's a car, the color primarily, or, you know, the interior coverings on the, on the upholstery. Um, but the, you know, the man's going to be thinking about the size of the engine or the speed of the processor and like, in, and okay, granted, uh, the, those maybe female typical concerns are surface and don't have maybe anything to do with the deep functioning. But by focusing on easy to measure metrics, more male typical concerns um, are those men can be confused into thinking that they've got the big picture. And it's not the big picture. It's a bunch of little tiny pieces that don't actually add up to the big picture of what is this doing and like what problems is it solving for me? And also what problems might it be creating? So we, of course, saw this during COVID, too, with the obsession over antibodies right? Yes. You know, the immune system is yes. not antibodies. That's definitely an important component, but... But you can find it. Right. But you yeah. can count it. You can talk about it. People know what you're saying, more or less. And so anyway, it became an obsession. 